There is only But uh, today's talk title is The Tao of Friendship. The Tao of Friendship. So, and this is in keeping with uh, this month's theme of love, being February, you know. And, uh, and in keeping with this thing, this past week we've had a couple of opportunities to open ourselves up to love. Or if we were really feeling courageous to extend, to extend ourselves into love, to extend maybe our true sentiments of love to, uh, to another. So this experience this past week may have left us, may have left some here feeling exhilarated or crestfallen, depending on how much attachment we had to the results and our own perceptions around the situation. And we talked about this last week as I referred to Valentine's Day as the national holiday of unrealized expectations. <laughs> and sometimes it can be that way. So remember we explored, uh, that's a little better, huh? So remember we explored the ideas of uh, cultivating friendship uh, during this week rather than getting caught up in all the trappings of the holiday uh, and all the, you know, the various sponsors of the Valentine holiday such as, you know, Hallmark, Seeds Candy, and others. <laughs> Zales. Yeah. So there was, but there was another event that passed this week uh, that was actually before Valentine's Day, and that was Ash Wednesday. Now, Ash Wednesday in the Christian calendar is the beginning of Lent, which is a, a time of preparation for uh, Easter Sunday, which traditionally is taught as being there's 40 days to Lent, but there's actually like 46 days because you don't count Sundays and uh, a couple other days that I don't come to his mind right now. So anyway, this idea of preparation, and we can use this within our own practice, this 40 day, this, this time of Lent. And so we talked about that on Wednesday night in our Practicing the Presence service. So we, we spoke to the idea, and in fact even did a guided meditation together around the idea of extending the invitation of love in our life by expressing love through this guided meditation where we not only loved everyone in the room and loved ourselves, of course, because we were in the room, but we also sent love out to our entire spiritual community, but also our extended community of Los Angeles, the state, uh, our country and the planet as well. So, if if you were feeling some unexplained sense of connectedness or a wave of goodwill or affection that overcame you on Wednesday night, that was us. So you can thank us for that. Like. Yeah. So Holmes tells us that our mental attitudes are contagious. Our mental attitudes are contagious. And this is why we're working with this idea of February as a month of love, and specifically on Wednesday night, working with the idea of cultivating warm love as Lenten practice in this time in a more conscious way. Because we recognize that love is a mental attitude, that our mental attitudes are contagious, as though we go around more or less enveloped in them. And the silent influence we influence on others is something that takes place automatically. So often in the science of mind teaching, I think that we forget that we don't have to force anything. That we're working with a principle that responds to us automatically. In the same way that we can take a ball or a rock and drop it, it's going to fall. In the same way that we, that we think consciously and bring our attention consciously to that which we want to 
uh, experience more in our life, there's a principle that automatically responds to that thought. This is, that's it. That's science of mind teaching. So some of us in this uh, Wednesday night have uh, made a commitment then to cultivate love, to cultivate the idea, actually the idea of being a transmitter of love, uh, one day at a time through this Lenten season. And you are welcome to join us. So you can either join us in person on Wednesday or just in your practice. And this practice can be done by ourselves alone on the cushion for sure. We can do that. Right? But why would we want to keep our light under the bushel basket, as the, as the Bible says? Why would we want to keep our light hidden? Well, this takes courage. It takes courage to extend ourselves in this idea of extending love to someone. And love is such a loaded word anyway. Even as I'm saying it, let's say there's 20, 30 people in here this morning, there's 30 different ideas of what that one word means. And so we don't have to... This idea of stepping courageously into acting in a loving way in the world, into cultivating more love, does not have to look like us going around and saying, uh, like the old beer commercial, you know, I really love you, man. Uh, in fact, in some circles that I run in, that might not be such a welcome thing. But we can practice compassion. Because compassion is like the kissing cousin of love. So the ancient Taoist writer recognized this when he said of compassion, compassion, and you know, in the Tao, uh, the Tao Te Ching is often written in the language of the warrior or the ruler, striving to become a sage. Right? So compassion then, he says, is the finest weapon and the best defense. If you, if you would establish harmony, compassion must surround you like a fortress. So think about how a fortress is built. You know, we build the fortress stone by stone, brick by brick, right, around us in the old days when you built a fortress. We do the same thing in consciousness. Remember, we're talking about a mental atmosphere. So with each stone of compassion, and stone is probably a bad metaphor because that's fixed and solid and immovable. Right? Compassion is a much more fluid thing. Compassion is the finest weapon and the best defense. If, if you would establish harmony, compassion must surround us like a fortress. Therefore, a good soldier does not inspire fear. A good fighter does not display aggression. A good conqueror does not engage in battle. A good leader does not exercise authority. This is the value of unimportance. This is how to win the cooperation of others. And this is how to build the same harmony that is in nature. So the Tao, of course, means the way. In some translations, it means the way of enlightenment harkens back to the times uh, they think maybe just before or maybe even a contemporary of Confucius. So there's all kinds of theories as to how this came about. But, but it is often uh, a common theme is this idea of, of shifting from being the warrior ruler into the wise sage. And that it's a natural process. And in fact, we can emulate, we can emulate and want to invite ways of harmonious of living because that is what we see expressed in the outer realm and nature itself. So the Tao Te Ching then can become a coaching guide to cultivate that mental atmosphere of being a sage. It teaches how to set about cultivating harmony peace, flexibility, even reconciliation. And are these not all attributes of friendship? Harmony, peace, flexibility, reconciliation. Again, Holmes, our mental attitudes are contagious as though we 
go around more or less enveloped in them. The silent influence we exercise on others takes place automatically. That friends attract friends. While antagonism not only repels people, it actually awakens a feeling of distrust and dislike within them. So, a definition of a friend, I went to Webster's and looked this up. This idea of cultivating friendship. One attached to another by respect or affection. Let's see, one who's not hostile. That's always nice to have in a friend. One who supports or favors something. And then another as uh, the extension of friendship then, uh, or I think maybe it's a... Um, something that we, uh, it's an assumption about friendship, is that there's a confidence, that we can, our friends can be a confidant. And a confidant being one to whom secrets are confided. Which begs the question, you know, are friends and confidence the same thing? Hopefully yes, but maybe not. Right? Now I can tell you that Although you may not have a friendly relationship with a practitioner, they are certainly a confidant. Right? In fact, they are bound by a code of ethics to not share anything of a confidential nature, even to the, uh, uh, to the extent that I've gone to Agneta for practitioner work and had told her that I had some lipo done, right, and that I was healing from that, that it would be out of, uh, it would be an ethical violation for her to come up to me, especially around a group of people, and say, hey, Reverend Mike, how'd that lipo go last week? <laughs> right? That would be, I mean, these are the kinds of, so we have, there's a consciousness, there's a consciousness to being a confident, there's a consciousness to being a friend. And the extension of confidant then, of course, is confidence, confidence to have or show faith. So aspects of friendship, respect, affection, faith, confidence. And I will ask you the question then, are these not also the experiences that we want to have in cultivating a relationship with the Spirit? You know, Agneta talked about this, you know, the importance in her own practice, and I would encourage all of us to cultivate this idea of spirit, that there is a, com a communion that happens with the spirit. And to really understand that we become one with the Spirit as our awareness and our understanding grows in recognition that we are some part of that. And that we see Spirit expressing itself throughout our outer world. So that in a very real way then, what we are looking for is what we are worth looking with. Did I say that right? What we are looking for. I think I said working for, right? I said, what, but what I meant to say was that in a very real way, what we are looking for, we are working with. So then Holmes again says that we should see everyone as a prototype of spirit. And if we do, the essence of God comes through as what? Friendship. So friendship is a big theme with Ernest Holmes. Right now, we are studying the essentials of Ernest Holmes. It was a compilation of various writings, from creative mind and success to all kinds of different, you know, the, the science mind textbook, of course, and other things. But friendship was a big thing to Ernest Holmes. So that friendship uh, on this plane of consciousness uh, was and is often cited and used as a teaching tool by Ernest Holmes to explain how spirit works in and through our lives. Especially when he says this, that it is almost certain that between friends, that 
between friends, there is a silent communion. There's a silent communication. A sort of unconscious mental conversation going on. So when this arises to the surface of conscious intelligence, it is also called mental telepathy. <laughs> mental telepathy, yeah. And this, and there, he goes on to say that this all leads to the conclusion that we, what we call our subjective mind is really the use of that which we as individuals make of universal subjectivity. So just as radio messages, radio messages are operative through a universal medium, so our thoughts are operative through a universal medium. Radio messages are sent to, we can't see them, we can't detect them, unless we attune to them. And not only that, but we can attune to all different kinds of messages through this universal medium. So we can, uh, we can attune to discordant, that discordant station of race consciousness that's telling us that the, the world is a terrible place, that people can't be trusted, that love is for other people, that I'm too much of this or too little of that, that you can't get a break, that the economy sucks so I can't find a job, I'll never get that promotion, I'm not going to get the girl or the guy. That's race consciousness. That's our old patterns of thinking maybe even because of our, the life experience that we have demonstrated up until this point maybe aligns more with that. But as we learn to attune, to attune our thinking to higher levels of thought, to levels of thought that invite and cultivate love, truth, beauty, these are the things that we experience in our life as a natural result of turning our attention to these things. So I don't know that Ernest Holmes was promoting telepathy so much in that uh, passage as much as he was illustrating that there are unseen connections between people who are attuned to each other and that we are attuned to each other through a universal subjective in the same way that we are attuned to spirit. So what friend then, what friend would wish ill on another? Some person whom you call friend, your closest friend, would they wish ill on you? What friend would not rejoice in you uh, getting a new job, a new love, a new home, maybe the birth of a child or a grandchild, or completing a, a college degree or some level of education? You know, friends rejoice in these things. And do you really think that spirit would want any less for you or me than to experience all of these things. So the master teacher talked with, uh, or spoke to this idea when he spoke about the lilies of the field. They do not toil nor want. Right? Yet Solomon in all his wisdom was not arrayed as one of these. That we too, that we too have a divine inheritance of good and that our main stumbling block is cultivating our awareness of God in all things, in every way of living, and that everything that we desire will be added unto us. Now, this does not mean... Well, I would just add this caveat for myself, right? I, I want to invite things into my life that are for my best good. That's an often different from what I want. Yes? What I want is often different than what is best for me. What I want is a cookie. Let's, but that's not best for me because I don't want to spend money on a new wardrobe. 
<laughs> right? But if a cookie is an errant thought with each cookie that I eat, or which actually maybe with each bite of a cookie that I take, right? Then I am inviting what? The opportunity to buy a new wardrobe. Right? Or do life and such. And go to my practitioner, who will keep it to herself. So don't tell anybody. So what we really have to get is that we can't out-demonstrate principle. We can't out-ask. We can't out-demand spirit. Okay? That we can't wear out our welcome. Right? That the door is always open and that the supply is limitless. So again from Holmes, that we deliberately trade in the old ideas of lack and limitation, of fear and pain, and in their stead create new ideas and of abundance and peace, of joy and friendship and opportunity. So that in this way then, our friendships then become mirrors of our good. That our friendships become mirrors of God in our experience. Because that's what we are looking with. We're looking to see the God within everyone. Especially those we may be in conflict with. And especially those in which God seems to be very cleverly camouflaged. But there's God in there. And Holmes says again, there is no person in the world in whom we could not find delight if we knew them in the right way. The truth is, everyone wants and needs friendship. Everyone. The person who does not uh, desire friendship is in some way needs a little uh, attitude adjustment. Now we must think of the whole world as our friend. But we must also be a friend to the whole world. And in this way, and with this simple practice, we will draw to us so many friends that we will the time will be too short to enjoy them all. This is Ernest Holmes talking. Okay? If we want to uh, experience abundance in our life, in any area of our life, in any place where we're feeling lack, limitation, constriction of any kind, that we must be a lover of the world. Because all of these things really are demonstrations of love helping to support our life. Yes? Yeah. So, and now I'm going to leave you this from the doubt. The sage does not distinguish between himself and the world. Basapa. <laughs> The sage does not distinguish between himself and the world. The needs of other people are as of his own. He is good to those who are good. He is also good to those who are not good. Thereby, he is good. He trusts those who are trustworthy. He also trusts those who are not trustworthy. Really? <laughs> okay. He also trusts those who are not trustworthy. Thereby he is trustworthy. So that the sage lives in harmony with the world. And his mind, his mind is the world's mind. It's like 3,000 years ago, right? The sage lives in harmony with the world and his mind is the world's mind. So he nurtures the worlds of others as a mother does her children. So let's go within for a moment. I'm going to invite our musicians to make their way up to the platform. So my friends, the Tao of friendship. So what do you say we work today? Just for today. Just for today. Cultivating more love in our life by seeing love in our life. Cultivating good in our life today. Recognizing that we live in a field of all of this stuff anyway. 
Because we live in a field of spirit. Today, let us practice for the next 12 hours and whenever we hit the pillow today. Seeing spirit in everything. Seeing the good in everything. Seeing the love in everything. Loving the stranger through the heart of compassion. Stepping into the courage of being a light unto our world. Stepping into the courage of being a light bearer. Not as a clanging symbol, but by simply being who we are. To be, as the Master Teacher said, to become a peacemaker. To be that. And as we cultivate that today, when we start our week off with this idea of propulsion into love, and see if it doesn't express itself through your entire week this week.